So, ladies and gentlemen, it's, first of all, thanks very much for the, uh, to the organizers of the conference for such a great event. And uh, thanks very much to Joseph Varadi, now being in Moscow in person. And it's my utmost pleasure to introduce Joseph to this fine audience and to hold this interview on this fine stage. So, Joseph, welcome to Moscow. Great to see you again after the pandemic. And uh, let's move on, let's kick off to, I, to something that I believe will be a fantastic sharing of insights from, I would say, uh, from the CEO of one, if not the most successful airline in Europe, being now, uh, in this, such a difficult time. Um, I remember it was about 2003, 2004, when Wizair name or brand started to appear on the, um, on the news, and it was very small airline, uh, you, I guess you started with just two airplanes and now you have well over 100 and hundreds on order. Maybe you could share just a few insights on how in just a few years, just 18 years, you are 18 years young, I don't want to say old, you are 18 years young as an airline and how in even 17 I would say, yeah, 17, uh, in such a short time you are now ruling Maybe not in the world yet, but Europe for sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here, and I'm really glad to be here in, in Moscow. Uh, I used to be spending quite a lot of time in your country, and I think you have a wonderful country, and uh, we have a lot of interest from a visa perspective with regard to building our scale and operations here in the, um, in the country. So I'm really uh, very happy to be, uh, to be back here, and the timing is just right because I understand that as of tomorrow, uh, life will change at least for some, some period, so it's a, good, it's a good timing. Well, with regard to our history, I think the, uh, uh, the core uh, of Vizer's success is its relentless focus on, on a model which you know, we thought at the beginning would, uh, would be very important to, uh, to implement uh, and make it relevant to the market. And in, in a commodity business, lowest cost wins, lowest cost prevails, and this is the model that we have been implementing. And, and, and the, the single biggest challenge to every airline uh, is that airlines tend to start pretty well at the beginning, but they get distracted and they move away from the, the business model and they start making their life very complicated. We have been always keeping ourselves to the, uh, to the core of the model and we have been just very focused in uh, doing better what we used to be doing, uh, what has made us successful in, uh, in the past yesterday, you know, to make sure that we continue to succeed on that basis uh, tomorrow going, going forward. And it is the focus, we think that uh, the business model what we have is the most relevant business model in, uh, in the airline industry. People want to travel, people want to fly, I think mobility is one of the utmost important issues for, uh, uh, for, for human beings. And, and the best way to serve that kind of genuine consumer need and demand is to provide access to markets at the lowest possible cost because people actually don't want to travel. I mean, they travel because they want to do something at the other side of the equation, at the destination. Uh, travel is a mean, it's not a purpose. And, uh, and as such, uh, we have to make sure that it is very efficient, very low cost, um, uh, no hassle for the consumer. And this is really the model that we are delivering on. Thanks very much for this quick introduction. And as I have watched uh, the news and Vizair news, I think particularly in the last two or three years, uh, and I would say even in particular in the last one and a half years, uh, Vizair has been all over the news. Like uh, Vizair is going to this base, opening this route. Ali Tale is getting out of out of business, finally, I guess, and with there is moving to Malpensa and so on and so forth. And uh, I would say now, today, on October 27th, Joseph, are you about to make another uh, news, news announcement and uh, surprise us with another bold move? So go ahead, please. Well, I have a great news for you today. We are launching um, Moscow Abu Dhabi, uh, starting operations on the 15th of, uh, of December. Um, well, believe it or not, but we actually opened up a new airline during the pandemic um, a few months ago. Vizair Abu Dhabi started flying. That's, uh, that's a Vizair subsidiary airline based in Abu Dhabi, and now this airline is going to operate uh, 
Moscow, Nukovo to, uh, to Abu Dhabi, which I think is great news to the, uh, to the market. It will become a daily service uh, between the, the capital cities of the, uh, of the UAE and, and Russia. And we think that we bring in diversity to the market and we bring in a low-cost alternative to existing players. So it just creates more choices for people. So well, welcome on board, uh, should you be decided to, um, uh, to, to fly into um, to Abu Dhabi or to the UAE. Uh, I think it's going to be a great service, and that's the news of the day today here in Moscow. What plane are you, with which plane, plane are you kicking off that route? We're going to be flying it with brand new A321neo aircraft, 239 seats on the, uh, on the aircraft. This is the, uh, the latest uh, airline, uh, this is the latest airplane technology in the marketplace, and we think this is an unbeatable aircraft. Uh, this is the best aircraft in terms of economics, but also this is the best aircraft in terms of sustainability. It's... Uh, environmental impact. Uh, it is 20% lower unit, uh, fewer burn than, than the AC-20 or the Boeing 737 uh, variant, and it's 50% less noise than uh, existing aircraft. So I think we are doing something good for the environment, and also we are doing something good for the consumers, because we are passing the savings coming through aircraft economics on uh, fares uh, to benefit the consumers. And some marketing and sales promotion for Airbus as well, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. yeah uh, but they deserve it. I mean, uh, I mean that's a good product. I mean, uh, I think with AC21 Neo, Airbus outsmarted the, um, the OEM market. And Airbus needs that because there's like ice hockey team here in, you know, in the sec third row. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, I, by, by the way, I remember when you guys kicked off and we did some uh, preparation together, kicked off Budapest, St. Petersburg crowd. Uh, and I remember I took the first flight. Uh, from Budapest to St. Petersburg, and I was surprised that on the day one, the load factor was like 96% mm -hmm. back and forth St. Petersburg. So expect that same will be on Abu Dhabi, Moscow from day one on A321 Neo, huh? No, I'm sure. I mean, I mean you know that um, the UAE uh, and the broader GCC uh, are a great destination market for, um, uh, for Russians, and I think there is a lot of leisure interest of the Ru Russian population going, going there, and, and we think it's a good service for the, uh, the market, and I, I hope that many of you and others will benefit from that. It looks like Abu Dhabi will be becoming even more Russian-speaking destination. <laughs> it, it, it is already uh, <laughs> Russian-speaking, but uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, if you look at Vizair today, actually Vizair uh, operates a group of three airlines uh, we have Vizair Hungary that operates our European platform, EU platform. We have Vizair UK uh, that is a, a separate AOC now, and we uh, created that airline for playing contingency on, on Brexit, and now it is a significant operating platform. And now the newest venture is, is, is Vizair Abu Dhabi. So, yeah, you are welcome to uh, any of these airlines. And Joseph, this COVID-19 story for Vizair seems like you guys well in advance expected that to happen so well prepared you are it seems like you are emerging from that whole story as one of the basically financially strongest airlines in the world i would say yeah. uh well did you expect that to happen <laughs> how did you well, prepare for the pandemics and um, if you could maybe share a little bit some insights when you start to understand this tsunami is coming from china mm. Still, Europe is moving around, and I remember this end of January, February 2020, we had a nice event with CF, CFM, not, not your engine, but still in, in Mijev in the Alps, and nobody was still kind of thinking that whatever was starting in China was just about to hit mm. Europe. And then it hit, March, just boom, Every, everybody is on the, at the bottom. But then in June and July of 2020, over through the fall of 2020, with their announces new moves, new, new routes, new bases. Maybe share a little bit how you manage all that thing uh, from the inside. You had, what did you do to, how you, start, how you met that tsunami and how did you swim through that tsunami in 2020 and 21? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm an economist by training. And one of the first things what you learn in economic theories is that economies develop through cycles. So when there is an up cycle, there is going to be a down cycle. And already, I think the world was kind of saying in 2017 that life was too good to be true. So uh, if you were really kind of applying some common sense, uh, you should have expected a downturn 
coming. Of course, we didn't know how the downturn would be triggered, whether that would be triggered by an economic crisis, geopolitics, or pan pandemics, or, or, or whatever. Uh, but we knew it was coming. So I think we were pretty much ready for uh, an, an economic shock uh, to, the, uh, to the business. We, we were building a lot of cash, a lot of liquidity, because you know that if it's a crisis, it's all about cash. It's all about the money. It's, you know, uh, cash becomes king even more than, than before. Uh, surprisingly, you know, many airlines were just unprepared uh, to, uh, to deal with a situation like this, but I think we were. Secondly, we always looked at uh, COVID-19 as an opportunity for the business. If I'm a little cynical, I would even say that COVID-19 probably was the best thing that could have happened to our business. Because uh, under a crisis situation, you kind of see the winners sorted out from the losers in an industry. Uh, and in good times, kind of everyone looks good. Uh, in bad times, not so much. Uh, you really see differences between uh, winning and losing uh, business activities and, and business at entities. And we felt that that was our almost like one-time opportunity to take advantage of the, uh, of the reset of the market. Because you know that the whole system gets distressed, your competitors get distressed, uh, many of the businesses, airports, countries, politics, governments, we evaluate uh, what they want to do, and, and, and that just creates a vast of opportunities for, for the business. So let me just give you some numbers. Today, Wizard operates a, a network of around a thousand routes, of which 300 were launched during the pandemic. Uh, we opened up 17 new operating bases. We got into uh, the pandemic with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, 20, 26 operating bases. We are now having 43 operating bases. So we opened up 40% uh, of our operational setup just during the pandemic. We grew our fleet uh, by 35 aircraft. We took 35 brand new aircraft deliveries from, uh, uh, from Airbus since March 2020. Now we are having a fleet of around 150 aircraft. Uh, so we have been growing. We have been diversifying our market presence. We have been diversifying our ge geographical footprint. We entered a lot of new uh, markets. We entered Italy. We entered Albania. We started flying visa Abu Dhabi. So we really looked at it from an opportunity perspective. But I think it's easy to say, but you, you need to have, I, I think, at least two preconditions uh, to be able to invest into, uh, into new activities. One, uh, as said, this is a commodity. In commodities, lowest cost wins. We are the lowest cost producer in Europe. So we have a cost advantage no one else has in the, uh, in the industry. And two, we had a lot of money. No one else had money in the industry. So we were able to move strategically given our cost base, and we were able to move strategically because of our liquidity on hand. Uh, being able to invest against these, uh, these market opportunities. Now, having said all of that, of course, that doesn't mean Wizard has been immune from COVID-19. We have been deeply affected. We have been losing a lot of money. Um, we have been playing roller coaster in terms of uh, uh, winding capacity down and then uh, building it back up. So let me just give you a few numbers that you understand the roller coaster what we have been taking. So March 2020, we operated 100% of our capacity. April. A month later, 3% of our capacity. August, 81% of our capacity. November, 10% of our capacity. And this uh, August, we operated 105% of our capacity. Obviously, we have been growing and we have been operating 105% versus 2019. So we have been going up and down like this. Um, I think that kind of probed us on our agility. Uh, how quickly we can decide, how we quickly we can move. I think we kind of better understood our own capacity, our own capabilities, how flexible we are. We are a very flexible organization. We are a very agile uh, organization. And again, most importantly, we have the cost base to compete and we have the, the liquidity uh, to be able to invest. And I think that's how we have been managing the business. But really, we separated out two issues uh, dealing with the day-to-day distress of the business, the roller coaster effect, but at the same time, we kept our eyes uh, open on strategic opportunities and kept investing uh, against new markets. Wow, impressive. So basically, by end of this year, in terms of 2021 numbers, where do you expect to be the numbers of passengers that you will have carried, approximately? So 2019 was 42 million. 
uh, passengers. Uh, this year, we're going to be 30 some million passengers. So, roughly speaking, I would say we will be delivering around 75% of our uh, of our passenger base, and roughly around um, on a on an annualized basis, roughly around 90% of our capacity will be operated. And then the next question would be, what's your view for 2022? How do you see the winter 21, 22, and then the summer of 22? In, in terms of your projections and how you see that uh, the industry wide, in, particularly in Europe, maybe. Yeah, I think 2022 is going to be a, a great year for Vizair. I mean, you know, we are talking talking about the recovery rate in the industry, and depending on who you talk to, some people are talking about 2024, some 2026. But but I think the real point is that different airlines will recover differently uh, from the uh, the crisis. Vizair, given the uh, uh, the business model, what we have, given that we are a point-to-point -point airline, given that we are much focused on, uh, on on low cost operation, we will be the first airline to recover much quicker than anyone else in the, uh, in the industry. So it may take another four to five years for some of the players, but I don't think it's going to take that much uh, for us. So I would be expecting 2022 uh, to become a pretty strong year for, uh, for Vizel. Winter, uh, coming is still wobbling. I think it's still a bit of a roller coaster. I mean, you, you are seeing it now. I mean, I think Russia is a good example. Uh, you had a fairly open summer. People traveled a lot, and now there is a lockdown coming, and we are seeing the same thing in Europe, in uh, in, in other countries in the in the world. So, uh, COVID-19 is not over yet. I think this is still affecting us. This is still impacting our life. Uh, it is still impacting uh, government decision making, and as a result, it keeps affecting. Uh, um, uh, travel conditions, restrictions to, uh, uh, to travel. I think summer is going to be a good summer. Um, we're going to be a much bigger airline if you just look at our numbers. Uh, this summer, uh, 2021, we operated roughly around 115 aircraft. Um, and next summer, we are planning on operating 170. So we're going to be growing year on year 50%. I mean, that's a huge growth we are putting on the, uh, on the market. But we are very confident we are able to deliver on that growth because obviously that 50% growth comes across through a very diversified uh, market uh, presence uh, given the maturity coming through of new investments uh, like Italy, like uh, Visa Abu Dhabi. Um, so, yeah, I think we are... Uh, looking at 2022 still as a somewhat affected year, mainly at the front end, uh, but catching up uh, in summer and hopefully we can continue on that basis uh, going forward. In terms of passenger numbers, I think our passenger number, uh, numbers will far exceed 50 million uh, passengers, so we will, uh, oh, we, will, we will exceed 50 million for sure. Pretty cool, pretty brave. So it looks like, uh, in terms of numbers, you will have surpassed uh, your 2019 levels. Just oh, in a big way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's well. You see, for for different airlines, COVID-19 and ends in on different time, basically. Um, what I noticed that before the uh, pandemic hit our industry, uh, the LCC sector, low cost segment, uh, reached about 35 percent of total of passengers carried uh, across the world, which was a significant number um, reached basically in the, in the last, let's say, 25 years since the, uh, the real cost, low cost segment started to appear on the radars of global aviation. But with the numbers that you just talked to us about, these are numbers and what is going on with Ryanair and other low cost guys such as Jet in, in, in the, in the North, North America and other parts of the world. Would you say that when the global aviation numbers are back to uh, pre-COVID numbers levels, would you see LCC segment hitting beyond 50% of total um, sort of market share? I mean, that's, that's not the question. The only question is when the 50% is going to be hit. I think the very latest in Europe is 39% low-cost uh, low traffic in Europe. Uh, I think very quickly uh, it's going to be over 50%. I mean, clearly... Uh, people are not prepared to be ripped off. Uh, why should they pay excess amount of money uh, for a two-hour flight? I mean, that's a, that's a fairly functional uh, travel. Um, I think consumer needs are pretty clear, uh, especially new generations of, of travelers coming to the, uh, to the market, the youngsters. I mean, they are very economically savvy when it comes to uh, decision-making of how much they are prepared to pay for uh, airline tickets. The airline industry has changed fundamentally. I mean, uh, the glory of this 
uh, high service uh, quality, privileged uh, travel for a fortune, what you have to pay, uh, I think that's over. It is a commodity and it has to be that with like a, like a commodity and in commodities lowest cost wins. And I think if you want to be successful as an airline, you need to be focused on that premise. In this respect, I will have even more questions to you. I remember back in 2016 when we met in the Dublin Air, Air Finance Conference, I asked you a question, what do you believe would be a setup of European market uh, back then in the next five years? And, well, I must say, you got it basically 100%. Uh, sort of low-cost guys within the, the continent and then long haul through uh, sort of between the big sort of hub destinations will be sort of moved more and more toward legacy carriers and how we see the composi composition of that sort of, um, of that market well basically you got it 100% right now five years later I want to ask you one once again but well, how do you see the business travel developing well basically still there are people who would like to travel in comfort but well there is no basically offer uh, there is no supply of, of sort of comfort travel among the airlines basically where will this sort of premium traffic move are they all these guys going they basically they will have a choice either to fly with you or ryan or easy uh, or almost well maybe luvanza but almost in the same manner uh, or they will have to try to catch a, a private flight one way or another maybe you could deliberate on that because still a premium traffic is still a, a, a significant size segment in terms of particular revenues? Right. My good question, I mean, my view is that uh, if you look at short haul travel, short haul travel, let's call it like up to three hours. I think short haul travel will be low cost airline dominated uh, traffic. And if legacy carriers want to compete, uh, to some extent at least, they will have to kind of wind down the product and they try to, they need to try to match the productivity factors uh, of the uh, of the low cost airline industry and productivity really means you know aircraft seat configuration getting rid of business costs you know all, all the sort of uh, issues um, so I think the uh, the short haul travel will converge around the principles of low cost flying uh, long haul travel is different I think the um, the consumer needs are different for long haul travel so I can see a more differentiated product uh, when it comes to long haul travel um, and I'm pretty sure business class uh, will prevail as a, com a concept uh, going, going long haul. And then you have this question of, um, you know, privacy and, 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 you know, business jets or private jets. I'm pretty sure that these, this line is going to pick up um, uh, pace uh, going forward. So if you are uh, time constrained and uh, you, are, uh, you are prepared to, uh, to pay a premium uh, for your privacy or, you know, the time what you gain uh, by taking a private jet, you know, that's going to be an alternative. Uh, but Personally, I don't think that short haul business class makes much sense in the uh, in the future. You are you are seeing that trend already. Maybe less so in Russia, uh, certainly less so in the Middle East. Uh, you know, we are in the GCC. We are looking at what Dubai is doing, what Abu Dhabi is doing. I think the business class idea is still kind of a prevailing concept, uh, but it's sort of changing as well. I mean, Fly Dubai is now feeding into uh, into Emirates. Uh, you see European airlines uh, basically. European airlines, the majors are offering the same seats uh, for business class as uh, Vizair. Uh, maybe the, uh, the middle seat is blocked out uh, for the time being, but maybe that will change o over time. So I think short haul travel is going to change. It's, it's going to evolve uh, towards the principles of low, cost, of low cost flying even more in the future. By the way, if you take Abu Dhabi, Moscow and back flight, would, what would you fly? Would you fly a, a private jet? Or you no, no, fly no, no. with air? No, no, no. I, no I, I'm, I'm, or, or Emirates? No, I, I fly with air. I'm very happy to, uh, to fly our product. I mean, uh, you can also differentiate yourself and your kind of level of comfort on with air. I mean, you can take extra leg group seats, take one of the exit row seats, uh, you can take the first row seat. So if you want to get more privacy, more, more comfort out of uh, flying with air, I mean, you can do that. I mean, uh, uh, I mean with that respect, the, the aircraft is, is offering different level of comforts, uh, so you can take a commodity seat, but you can also take kind of a privileged seat, and you, you pay a bit more uh, money for that, but you're going to get more comfort out of it. You just mentioned, and also the, one of the previous speakers, uh, CEO of UTR Group here in, Mo in Russia, mentioned that basically air travel has become a commodity in a way. And brands are sort of, the notion of a brand is basically evaporating. 
yet still Wizz Air is a strong brand. But do you see Wizz Air as a brand becoming ever stronger? Or you would see that it kind of fades away and you become just an, a group of airlines that produce a whole bunch of passenger available seat kilometers filled with passengers. Don't you see some sort of contradiction with their, or maybe some other brands like Ryan kind of fighting for themselves, yet everybody's speaking that it's commodity, commodity, and brand influence is becoming less and less, uh, weaker and weaker? Uh, look, I mean, I'm coming from that business, so I think I have a fairly sophisticated view on, on commodities and brands. So I, my background is Procter & Gamble. That's a branded business. That is no more commodity thing than fast-moving consumer goods. And, and you can see how important brands are uh, there. I mean, when you, I don't know, when you buy uh, diapers, uh, let's say, I mean, you think of Pampers, uh, and that's a hell of a brand, and, you know, that kind of affects your mind. Even, even Pampers kind of defines the category uh, for, uh, for uh, diapers. You know, you, you, you buy like a, uh, like a Hoover. I mean, Hoover defines a category uh, for, uh, for, for a, a commodity. So I think airline brands will continue to be very important. I mean, that will affect consumers' choice. That will affect consumers' uh, confidence. I mean, brands are important. I mean, airline business is not a straightforward business in a way that it's uh, technically complicated, flight safety is concerned. Uh, so I think you have to be a trusted brand uh, overall, trusted for the consumer from a commercial uh, pur uh, purpose, also for, uh, for flight safety uh, to purposes. So actually the brand is very important and we are very driven as we said to continue to build the brand, uh, enhance the brand, the perception of the brand and you know, we are investing a lot into the uh, into the brand, not only in terms of imaging uh, the brand, but also in terms of uh, improving the inter interactions with the consumers. And through that consumer experience, uh, we are elevating the brand in the minds of the, uh, the consumer. So uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the, uh, the issue of branding in the uh, industry is, is very, very important. As a matter of fact, I think this is creating one of the entry barriers for some of the other businesses, the likes of, I don't know, like Amazon or Google, etc. You can argue that long term, uh, those people might be interested in, in, the, uh, in the airline business. But this is just not just a capacity, this is not just a seat what you offer, but also you, you put the trust of the brand uh, to the equation. I think that's going to drive consumer decision making. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. But this, your answer leads me to the next question. Uh, well, we, you mentioned some of the global brands, and well, we can maybe some of the global, most global brands are okay, Apple and Amazon. Well, Amazon, yeah, Amazon. But Coca-Cola, for example, McDonald's, and you know either you are in Argentina or New Zealand or Japan or in Moscow, McDonald's is McDonald's. It's not so in the airline industry. I would think what would be one of the most global brands? And I, first of all, I can't name one. And if I name one, let's say, for example, Emirates, it's still kind of Gulf related and United Arab Emirates airline. And even the largest airlines by numbers of passengers carried, let's say Delta for that matter, it's a United States airline. Uh, but do you see in the next 5, 10, 20 years some truly global aviation brands appear uh, on, on the market where no matter where you are, you, kind of, you can find it, you can fly it, and you can expect same quality of service and reliability to, well, for, for the customer? But I mean, between you and me, I think this industry, from a branding perspective, is a fairly screwed industry. Uh, <laughs> I mean, all this co-chairing and interlying agreement, etc., has just been undermining uh, the consumer perception in terms of brand quality and performance quality to the, uh, to the consumer. I mean, um, I mean, you can buy an airline ticket, but you never experience the airline because uh, each of the legs of that ticket uh, mm -hmm. is operated by someone else. Uh, so you don't really get the brand experience. So I think from a branding perspective, this industry is a very bad example. I think this industry has been run uh, as a pretty poor kind of a branding, uh, branding exercise. But we are very keen on the brand. We are very keen on the consumer experience. Uh, and if you, if you look at it, you know, should you be flying with Air UK uh, or with Europe or with Abu Dhabi, you are going to get the same experience. It's totally seamless from a consumer standpoint. Um, and you wouldn't even notice the difference which airline you are flying because we are so keen on on creating uh, a unified uh, platform for experiencing the, uh, the brand. Globalizing the brand, I think we remain subject to the regulatory framework uh, in the industry. I mean, let's not forget that uh, 
this industry is a highly regulated industry, not only for operational purposes, but also for commercial purposes, for getting access to, uh, to markets. Uh, you know, kind of the bilateral market regime continues to prevail uh, in most of the geographies. Yeah, inside the European Union, it's an open market. Inside the United States, it's an open market. But in between, like between Russia and Europe, that's a bilateral market. Between the US and, uh, I don't know, Asia, it remains a, a bilateral market. So we shall see how the regulatory framework uh, continues to evolve. And I think that will determine the pace of global brand development in the industry. Over time, we'll get there. Maybe this is not my lifetime, but over time, I think we're going we're gonna to be, we're gonna be there. But this I just wanted to ask you, maybe in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, we there will become such a brand, kind of truly global. Well, I mean, I think we are uh, a brand that is very consistent. Uh, to what extent can be globalized? Again, I think we'll, we'll be subject to regulatory developments, but probably of the European brands, certainly of the European low-cost mm -hmm. airline brands, we are the most globalized brand, if mm -hmm. you wish. Uh, if you look at our geographical footprint, I think we have the, uh, the most reach uh, what we, uh, we can deliver. We, we fly to more countries than any of the other European low-cost carriers, and if you look at kind of the geographical spread, uh, we are certainly uh, covering a greater uh, geographical territory than any of the other airlines. So you, you'll be at least the first truly pan-Eurasian brand. Let's put, put it that way, way yes. <laughs> at least in your lifetime, for sure. No, you need to win something, yeah, let's, <laughs> right. let's, well, let's put it that way. Let's, let's maybe focus on the Russian market. Mm -hmm. We are in Russia, and uh, you just announced a new route uh, to from Moscow. Um, and uh, during the pandemic time, you announced uh, no, no, even just before you announced a new operational base in St. Petersburg. Mm. Maybe you could elibor elib elaborate a little bit more on how you see the Russian market in, in the next couple of years. What's the Russian market for you, taking all these hundreds, of, over a thousand routes uh, that you now operate? And, uh, well, you just, in the pandemic time, you started a new airline in Abu Dhabi. Now you have three airlines. And I remember there were times uh, when you were contemplating setting up a Russian uh, outfit. Uh, where are you on that? Uh, where, where are you on these plans? So would be very, I think that would be very interesting to hear for the audience from you. Well, personally, I think the Russian market is a fantastic future opportunity for the, for the airline industry. And I would say that probably there are three major components affecting the development of the Russian market. I mean, first of all, uh, from a consumer standpoint, uh, GDP development, availability of disposable income, uh, people's ability to, um, to fly and being able to afford uh, flying will be one of the drivers. And clearly you see that uh, the GDP growth propensity to fly continues to increase. Uh, so I think that's one dynamic, and I'm pretty confident that uh, Russian GDP will continue to grow in the, uh, in the future, and that will <clears throat> create more um, uh, discretionary um, spending opportunities for the, uh, the consumer. I think the second issue is to what extent um, the country opens up from a regulatory perspective, so what kind of uh, an access uh, people have to different markets and uh, um, where people can travel, and I think that corresponds with issues like visa, uh, and genuine openness of the, uh, of the market. I mean, quite clearly, if I look at the world, the, the, I think the world is becoming a more open place uh, for people. People have the capacity and the ability to travel around and discover the, uh, the world uh, less and less restricted than, uh, than before. So I would be expecting a positive development with that regard. And I guess the third factor is, is how competitive dynamics will play into the, um, in, into the Russian aviation market, into the airline market. Um, you know, um, can an airline like Viser uh, play a bigger role in Russia being able to fly more? And this is more related to the, uh, to the, to the very regulatory framework affecting the, uh, the operation of the industry, the airline industry. So I think these three factors will determine um, how prospective uh, and how uh, kind of hopeful the Russian aviation development uh, will be in the, uh, in the future. As far as Vizad is concerned, I mean, we are, we are very excited. I mean, obviously, we still have limited presence in Russia because uh, uh, we are subject to bilateral regulations. So we are flying from Hungary, um, UK, and now Abu Dhabi, so where we have AOCs. But, of course, we would like to fly 
more. I think the St. Petersburg initiative is important with that regard. Uh, although at the moment, due to the COVID issues, uh, that initiative is somewhat um, descaled, mm -hmm. and we'll see how that's going to uh, come back. But uh, overall, uh, we think that you know, Visa is an airline that can bring uh, bring in a world-class product to the uh, to the market. A lot of access to the uh, uh, to the consumer, a lot more network opportunities for the uh, uh, the consumer, and we would be bringing in innovation uh, in the uh, in the marketplace. And innovation is important because uh, this industry will fall under huge pressure in the next 10 to 20 years to to innovate. If uh, for nothing else, just for environmental or sustainability purposes, it's very clear that sustainability is gaining traction. Um, it is going to be a huge agenda uh, globally, but also particularly for the industry. And innovation will be, uh, will be very important. And we are one of those most innovative airlines that um, uh, tend to engage with new technology, uh, new operating platforms um, as soon as you know, these technologies become, become available. So I think we could be in the forefront of innovation, bringing in new technology and uh, operating that technology at the highest level of efficiency which I think the market would benefit from. Uh, I think competition would benefit from because obviously uh, competition makes uh, the players, I think, stronger businesses, better, uh, better uh, uh, formidable competing forces. And I think that's what we can bring to the bar market. But we shall see how the, um, the regulatory framework continues to evolve and what opportunities uh, we would have as a result. But we are very committed to Russia and certainly we would like to do more uh, in the future. But to be a little bit less diplomatic than what you, how you've yeah. been just been, I guess you were there, Russia is not yet on your planning radar. Well, I mean, I think we are, we are looking at um, all options, uh, what, we could, uh, what, what we could think of at the moment. We are working on, um, you know, getting access to more points in Russia, mm -hmm. um, getting uh, into Russia as an inbound uh, carrier from more European points where we have operating bases. So uh, I think we're going to go step by step. And uh, um, uh, but you know, long term strategically, I think we would be looking at um, various various options. I, but I just don't want to speculate here. I mean, overall, my my real message here is that uh, uh, I think we can bring in a word cross product that is very relevant to the market, uh, but we need, we need to be permitted uh, to do that. Okay, fair enough. But still, st sticking a little bit more to the Russian market, for one more question at least. Um, in Russia, there is one low-cost airline called Pabeda, as a part of, it's a part of Arafot Group, legacy airline, mm -hmm. uh, and it was recently announced that S7 Group uh, is about to launch uh, low-cost airline, I think it will be called Citrus, or something like mm -hmm. that. But still, another legacy kind of hub-and-spoke carrier, uh, who is a part of uh, One World Alliance, is kicking off, uh, setting up uh, a low-cost airline. Uh, there has been sort of a history of uh, legacy carriers setting up low-cost airlines. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on the success stories of all those Deltas and uh, Iberias of the world who did set up low-cost airlines, and how you see these, these kind of airlines, uh, low-cost airlines set up by legacy guys, how they have performed over, over time? No, sure. I mean, the success rate of low-cost carriers set up by legacy airlines is exactly zero. Um, so no legacy airline in the world has ever been able to make a low-cost airline work. And I mean, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out why. It's simply because kind of legacy principles over time just kind of creep over uh, into the, um, the low-cost business models. So those low-cost business models become compromised uh, at one point, and we start underperforming. And if I look at the US, if I look at Europe, every legacy carrier failed uh, with their low-cost airline venture or failing uh, with their low-cost airline venture. They are not able to make money. Um, uh, they can do a lot of activities, they can fly a lot of routes, so there is nothing wrong with that, and they can burn a lot of money in the end, and they are not going to create shareholder value uh, in the end. But, you know, we are, we are in the business of creating shareholder value. I think if you are really serious about low-cost flying, uh, it has to be an independent uh, business, it has to be unrelated to, uh, to legacy carriers, it has to be un uncompromised uh, versus legacy carrier 
uh, principles. I don't think Russia is there yet, uh, but in a way, Russia is a fairly protected market at this point in time. The real change will come when Russia opens up uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, and then uh, you will really see the, the real strengths or weaknesses of these uh, business approaches. But looking at the world, not one airline has created a successful low-cost airline. Thank you, doctor, for your very honest diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on. And uh, you, again, uh, recently, uh, with the order of A321 XLRs, I think it's 30 aircraft that you just announced uh, a year or two ago, uh, you're basically moving to new frontiers, sort of into the segment of something that we can call low-cost on haul. Uh, well, there are some questions about it. And you are ordering this aircraft with 244 seats, right? 39, 239. Uh, 239. And this aircraft will be capable of flying of nine plus hours. So how do you see this segment uh, developing? How do you see yourselves in this kind of, sort of low cost, long haul segment? And how do you see passengers, uh, let's say 238 passengers in 239 layout flying over nine and a half hours? Uh, I think you are going a bit too far with the nine and a half hours. I think we are looking at the XLR more like a seven hour flying. Uh, eight hours. Maybe. Okay, maybe eight hours. Um, when we started flying uh, routes for five, six hours, this is the range what we are having today with the current aircraft. Uh, I was incredibly pessimistic and I felt that, uh, you know, we will not be able to sort of transition um, from up to three hour flying to six hours of flying, uh, simply because you would be kind of jeopardizing passenger comfort, etc. cetera. Um, but passengers took it incredibly well. Um, if I look at engagement of consumers for flying five, six hours, there is no difference versus flying two to three hours. Uh, they are paying the price, and we are getting the same level of profitability from mid-haul flying as from short haul flying. So on that basis, I'm actually pretty confident that we can move from six hours to seven hours or even eight hours. Uh, whether that would translate into a, um, a low cost long haul motor, I'm not sure. That's not the way we are looking at it. The way we are looking at it is that we have a, a very large geography already. I mean, if you just think about it, so we are flying, let's say, between London and Abu Dhabi, but we are unable to fly London, Abu Dhabi uh, with the current uh, range mm -hmm. capabilities of the, uh, of the aircraft. The XLR would give us the possibility of flying Abu Dhabi to London nonstop. So before we start wandering around, you know, what we could do beyond our existing uh, geographies, uh, certainly we would be much focused on looking at what we can do inside our uh, existing uh, geographies. So that's the main purpose of the XLR. So we are just expanding and creating more opportunities for people uh, within our existing markets. Do you see yourselves going transatlantic? With Unlikely. Unlikely. All right. Well, uh, you've been one of the market leaders uh, on ancillary revenues. And I think at least in, in pre-pandemic pre times, your ancillaries were well over 40% of total revenues, if I'm correct. Correct me if I'm it's wrong. 50, it's 50% 50, it's 50 now. Now it's 50%. It's five zero, yes. Well, how do you see your ancillaries going forward? Do you see it's kind of taken well over half of your revenues and uh, well is it the way to for, for the future to increase and inc further increase ancillary share of your revenues no absolutely i mean i, I think that that's our genuine interest to uh, to kind of unbundle uh, the product and give choices to the consumer so and essentially it is the consumer to decide what services and products um, he or she wants to take and uh, wants to consume versus us. I mean, and our uh, main objective is to take down the fares as low as we can, because by applying the lowest fares in the market, obviously we can stimulate the market. We can bring more people into the franchise of flying, and we can make them um, uh, fly more frequently than, than before. So I need to reduce the fares as a result. But I can only make financial sense out of that proposition if I'm making, up, making it up with ancillary revenues. And I think it is probably the most democratic way uh, from a consumer standpoint, because it is the choice of the consumer. It is not my choice. So 
I don't know, when you get a coffee served on board of an aircraft and you feel, well, that's how nice you get a free coffee, I bet you this is your most expensive coffee in your life. I mean, you paid a hell of a lot of money for that coffee. Uh, in our case, I mean, you really make a choice. I mean, do you want to pay, I don't know, two euros uh, for a cup of coffee or, or not? Yeah. I remember I was flying with air from Moscow to Budapest, and then I flew back from Budapest to Moscow, and the price was so different that when I boarded with air flight, I was so happy that I was getting that value. Then I bought two coffees, two sandwiches, and then two wines, and a, and a model and a perfume for my wife. So <laughs> I finally ended up paying more on with air flight than on air flight flight, but I didn't pay a single additional penny on uh, my flight back to, to Moscow. You like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a very optimistic passenger, you know. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> we're going to get in closer to the end of our interview, but I have still have a lot of questions. Uh, by the way, in terms of uh, rev additional revenues, if you go so far uh, forward and, you know, over and beyond with uh, auxiliaries, do you ever see zero f air fares appearing on the market? Uh, Michael O'Leary uh, was speaking a few years ago about such opportunities, but now you, what would you say about this? Well, I mean, we, we, we shall see. I think if I can make up my entire revenue stream from answer revenues, yeah. I would be very happy to... Uh, to give, give to away tickets uh, for free. So I would be very happy to, to do that. I think it's still a long way to, uh, okay. to go, but we are certainly heading towards that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so if I, I don't know, if I look at the, uh, uh, the, the flights to Abu Dhabi from, from Moscow, I mean, you, you're going to be able to buy tickets for as, as low as 4,000 rubles. Um, I mean, that's, that's pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the cost of the seat is, is more than 4,000 uh, rubles. Uh, but my objective is to, to get you on board of an visa aircraft to experience the product and the service what we uh, provide. And I know that you know, if, if I do nothing, you're going to be spending probably 10,000 rubles on ancillary revenues and ancillary items. So that's, that's, me. that's me. That's you. So uh, <laughs> please come. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'll maybe it will be another flight that I will make my uh, journey on maiden flight of Wizz Air. Um, just before we start uh, sort of wrapping up our interview, maybe your view as Wizz Air CEO and a great visionary man for the next 10 years of aviation. I would like you, you to elaborate, elaborate a little bit on consolidation, and you've made an attempt recently. Uh, again, low cost versus legacy carriers, but You've been very clear on that, so as, as you wish. Of course, point-to-point -point, uh, versus hub-and-spoke models, uh, where that's going. And another thing that interests me, where all these global alliances are going after the pandemic. Are they staying around or are they just disappearing? So if you could just kind of put these uh, points in one answer, that would be fantastic. Okay, my view is that uh, short haul flying will be point-to-point, low-cost dominated. Short-haul connecting legacy models make no sense at all. Uh, not from an economic standpoint, not from an environmental standpoint. So I think they will be squeezed um, uh, and they will be almost like diminished by market force or I think in the end even by political force or the consumer will demand a greener operation of the airline industry and it's not that difficult to figure out that connecting on a short-haul basis, short-haul flying basis, through a hub-and-spoke uh, model makes no sense. Uh, so that's one statement. With regard to, um, uh, to players in the marketplace, I think you will see less low-cost carriers, uh, but they will be more, uh, more dominating, bigger, enjoying the, the benefit of, of scale, but obviously that should be translating into uh, an even lower cost operation and better fares uh, more competition, more alternatives, more connectivity brought to the, um, uh, to the market, to the, uh, to the consumer. With regard to the legacy carriers, um, I think you will probably have some of this global alliancing. You will have long-haul connectivity, so I can see that uh, long-haul hub and spoke will continue to, um, to prevail. But the big question will be who's going to operate the short-haul legs of that long-haul hub and spoke? Uh, will it be the legacy? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, but, but we are not going to compromise our business model. Um, and uh, also the question is how important connectivity is 
uh, for the uh, the consumer. So there are some new thoughts coming to the uh, to the equation. So let's use Abu Dhabi. Um, if you talk to anyone in the airline industry coming from the legacy side operating a intercontinental hub and spoke, they would say minimum, con uh, minimum connecting time is the utmost important thing for connection. Abu Dhabi is now saying, no, actually that, that's not true. So if there is someone in Abu Dhabi uh, trying to connect uh, to a long haul flight, why don't I just grab that consumer and, and, and try to put that person into hotels, into restaurants, into whatever, uh, spend more time and money on the ground in Abu Dhabi, as opposed to just pushing the guys through as quickly as I can uh, to go somewhere. Because if you really think about this, the economic value of a passenger connecting at the moment is maybe a cappuccino, if you are lucky and the guy takes a cappuccino in one of the restaurants in the airport, but you actually want to have that guy to go to a hotel, to restaurants, visit museums, etc., spend some money. So that's how you kind of monetize, um, you know, to, to your access to that consumer. So I think this could change. Um, and, um, and maybe we're going to be a bit smarter and uh, the various stakeholders in the industry will get a, a bit smarter. So, yeah, so back to the question, I think short haul, low cost airlines, point to point, long haul, some level of connectivity, um, some le level of alliances, but hopefully kind of a smarter way of operating the industry than today. And the very last question, you know, crisis is a great time to start a new business, a new airline. Uh, at least what the scholars say, and uh, well, our team just recently launched a new airline over in Kamchatka, near Alaska. So it's far away still from Budapest or London and Abu Dhabi, but uh, that's where we kicked off a new airline. So maybe from your early days of 2003 and 2004, when you started with Air, maybe give us a recommendation or two or three, uh, how we should behave ourselves to maybe in 15 years be similar to Vizair? Phew, you know, there is only one Vizair. Uh, <laughs> I said you, you similar. Yeah, you need, to, you need to keep that in mind. And look, I mean, uh, I think for any startup airlines, it, it is probably st the, the time to come to market because it's a crisis. That's when the industry gets reset, so that's an entry opportunity. Having said all of that, uh, it is a, a tough business to compete and survive over the, uh, over the long run. So my advice to you would be just stay very focused uh, of what you are good at and keep doing it better and better as opposed to start changing your mind um, on, a, on a frequent basis because that's how uh, airlines are going off rail and, uh, and, and start uh, putting pressure on financial performance and shareholder value. So for so long as you know what your mission is and uh, you can execute against that well and you actually create shareholder value on that basis, uh, just stay focused. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Aradi, CEO of Wizair. Thank you very much for your time and insights.